Hello and welcome. I would like to begin by acknowledging that we meet on the unceded lands of the Kulin people of Nam, which we now know as Melbourne. I'm on the lands of the Wurundjeri people and pay my respects to them and their elders. If you are joining us remotely today, I would also like to acknowledge that many other people present in today's talk may be on the lands of other traditional custodians and pay respect to those communities wherever they are as well. This morning's panel is titled Fashion as Freedom, Chanel and Feminist Design. Although Gabrielle Chanel herself didn't identify as a feminist, her designs emerged on the fashion and social scene at a critical time in the narrative of women's rights and freedoms. Chanel's clothes and accessories were groundbreaking in the way they fit, moved and looked, as well as their unexpected materials and styling. In this final of the Chanel in Contest sessions, we will discuss fashion, freedom and feminist design and how Chanel's early works fit into this complex picture. And to help me do this, I am very pleased to welcome here today Dr. Harriet Richards and Dr. Liliana Grace Pomazan. Dr. Harriet Richards is a research associate in the School of Culture and Communication at the University of Melbourne. She's co-founder of the Critical Fashion Studies Research Group and is currently working on projects investigating modern slavery and transparency in Australian fashion industry and ethical and sustainable fashion innovation. Dr. Liliana Grace Pomazan is an author, fashion studies lecturer, and fashion practice historian. Her expertise lies in the areas of Parisian haute couture and fashion design of the 20th and 21st centuries, including history and culture of regional styles and recent forms of contemporary Australian fashion practice. But first, a brief introduction to the exhibition, which if you haven't already seen, I hope you'll see today. Gabrielle Chanel Fashion Manifesto focuses exclusively on the work of influential French couturier Chanel Coco, sorry, Gabrielle Coco Chanel, born in 1883 um, through to 1971. Curated by the Palais Galliera, the Fashion Museum of the City of Paris, with support from the Patrimoine de Chanel, the Heritage Archive, this exhibition opened in Paris in October 2020. Visually sumptuous and spanning the breadth of Chanel's career, the exhibition charts the evolution of the famous Chanel style, a look best embodied by the designer herself. It explores the characteristics of her work, her codes, her legacy and features over a hundred outfits as well as jewelry, accessories, cosmetics and perfumes. Spanning nine thematic sections, charting a loose chronology, the exhibition illustrates the spirit of freedom and defiance that characterized Chanel's design. Exploring the many facets of her work, the exhibition highlights how Chanel rewrote fashion conventions to transform women's wardrobes with her innovative ideas, pioneering approach to fabric and construction and the utmost consideration of the female form. Chanel devoted her life to creating, perfecting and promoting new types of feminine elegance, grounded in the reality of women's lives. This was her fashion manifesto, a design style based on principles of comfort, streamlined simplicity and ease of movement that became a template for modern living. So to our topic. And hopefully, first slide, yes. <laughs> um, Chanel herself, interestingly and importantly, never defined herself as a feminist. And as Chanel expert and fashion historian Amy De La Haye recently stated, while Chanel may have emancipated women from restrictive fashion, she was certainly not an emancipator of women. And yet, at the very heart of Chanel's practice was the belief and philosophy that fashion should serve a woman's needs and respect their bodies. Her manifesto, if you like, a design style based on the principles of comfort, streamlined simplicity and ease. Chanel's designs were liberating in the sense of their adherence to modernist principles and in opposition to what had gone before. They proposed new sartorial norms that reflected in different conception of femininity and they acknowledged women's changing social roles. 
dressing them for greater participation in 20th century life. Chanel defiantly said, I decided who I wanted to be, and this is who I am. This is the spirit of freedom, of independence, and ambition that fueled Chanel's self-creation and characterized her design language. Chanel's fashions were her path to economic freedom and her social ascent, a self-made millionaire. Chanel's contribution to the history of women's fashion is significant, but what freedom did she bring to women? What are the intersections with and the divergences away from feminist thought and ideology? So for my first question to the panel, um, I might start with you, Harriet. <laughs> what and how would you define feminist design? Um, well, that's a very good question. When we were speaking about this with Danny the other day, I was kind of thinking about it, and I've been thinking about it since Tuesday um, when we spoke. And to me, it's really design that embodies, I guess, the, the tenets of feminism. So if we think about feminism being about women's equality or equality between the sexes, um, then it's allowing women to live in a way that is equal. So that's precisely what Chanel was doing um, by creating garments that allowed women to move freely and participate in the world as equal citizens. So whether or not uh, women had the right to vote, for instance, which we'll maybe get to later, um, they were still able to go, go out into the world to you know, ride a bicycle, to step into a motor car, to travel on public transport, for instance. Um, so it was design and is design that allows women freedom of movement, freedom of access to participation in, in civil society, really. Thank you. And I guess it's important always to, when we're focusing on one person, one person's contribution to sort of look more broadly to the socio-historic context. So I wondered if either of you wanted to perhaps um, speak to women's freedoms and, and restrictions during that early period, what, you know, what the reality of their lives were. Shall I start? Sure. Hello, everyone. Um, well, first of all, at the time that Chanel started her fashion practice, um, women were very much dressed in belly pop styles or late belly pop styles, which very much meant that they were wearing these extremely restrictive corsets um, we often read about the health implications of those corsets. You know, women would, um, they, you know, popular media would say that women would swoon if a handsome man entered the room. The fact of the matter was that they couldn't breathe. And um, so with these rigid corsets, they were all about, you know, um, making the bust protrude, um, the derriere protrude, um, hand span waist. And the clothing was very, um, I suppose we would say, upholstered, you know, not just the corset, but many, many petticoats. Very difficult and cumbersome. And one of the pet hates of Coco Chanel was also um, women wearing these enormous hats. Um, that's, you know, her first foray into millinery was to address that in a modernist sense. So Chanel personally uh, was very much against dressing in that particular way. But before Chanel um, really started her fashion practice, you know, we have to look at the key design precedents, thinking about Paul Poiret, Madeleine Viennet's foray. Now, Madeleine Viennet did close her couture house um, during World War I, and Poiret continued, as did Chanel. But it was about, you know, freeing um, the body. You know, we, we know about the aesthetic, you know, the reform movements of dress, which was so important um, to feminism. So, of course, you know, Chanel um, didn't identify herself um, as a feminist. However, her own lifestyle, her, the way she lived her life and the way she changed garments, um, you know, were very much in line with, you know, the tenets of feminism, um, of freedom, of mobility, of independence. But going back to Paul Poiret, I mean, he was, um, at the time, a, a radical designer in his own right. You know, we have to think about the context of the period. Um, he took um, women um, 
he did, anyway, got rid of the corset per se, the rigid corset, and just had a soft, elasticised one. You know, it's very difficult to have women wearing a certain type of undergarment then quickly transferring to a no bra bra type of uh, situation. So, but his dresses were long, um, mainly empire line, very soft, you know, the structure kind of hung from the shoulders, they were comfortable, but he had elaborate cloaks and, be, you, know, um, you know, was very keen on headdress and terribly inspired by the ballet russe and, um, you know, the luxury and grandeur of couture and he saw himself very much as an artist, um, Chanel didn't. So when we think about that key design precedence um, in the early part of the 20th century, in comes Chanel and with her own aesthetic code of modernism. Now, I know not all her clothing is part of the mod um, modernist lexicon, but her day wear was, and she really um, followed the tenets of modernism, form follows function, and really, as Katie said, streamlined um, her collections. They were devoid of extraneous embellishments. Of course, later comes the costume jewellery, but, you know, that, that was um, a part of her contribution, her incredible contribution. I mean, she was revolutionary and avant-garde in those days, in the true sense of the word, going against um, what was before, you know, what the tradition, traditional women's wear. No, thank you. Um, so that sounds like a good point to actually start talking specifically about the rise of Chanel and the detail, I guess, of what it was she pioneered in those first few decades. I'm actually just having a problem moving to the next slide, so I'm not sure if someone... Ah, fabulous, thank you. Um, just looking at the images behind us and the specifics of those early days and what she introduced, would you both like to sort of comment, I guess, on those first forays she made when she shifted from making hats um, into garments. Um, and I think just to, to follow on from what Liliana was saying before, it's so much about the silhouette. And I love the quote that you brought up before, you know, Chanel chose who she was and she made her fashion in her image. And I think if we think about that Edwardian silhouette, it was very much the S, the protruding chest and, um, undercarriage, I guess. Um, and so it was this S shape. And you see it even in the mannequins that you have in the exhibition. The silhouette of the body is so different and it's really reflective of Chanel's own body. That the, the shoulders, um, uh, the hips are forward rather than back. So it's like this opposite silhouette. And so the, the garments that she was designing were very much designed for her body shape rather than that Edwardian body shape, which is really fascinating, but that was kind of, um, I guess, liberating women from that very restrictive S shape and the, the tight corsets. So we can really see that here in these dropped waists, these very kind of um, linear lines, really, um, and the lower heeled shoe as well, which is nice. It's like, it's not going to sink into grass. It's very wearable. Um, and so that as well is liberatory really. It's, it's allowing that freedom of movement, which is really important. Yes, I think so too. When um, we look at the slide on the right hand side, um, I think in Deauville, um, this is Chanel's first foray into using um, fabrics that were usually considered um, only suitable for men's underwear. So it's quite radical using them um, for what she would perhaps call play suits, you know, being able to be on the beach, go for walks, but really walk, not just promenade in a stunning dress to be seen, you know. She was very quite, she was very interested in, um, uh, as Katie said, wearable clothing that one could really have fun with, you know, um, run, walk, skip. Of course, the, the length was longer on the right-hand side, I believe around 1913. But when we look at her heyday, you know, the other slide of 1920, around circa 1928, she's getting into the taxi. She's the quintessential modern woman. She's wearing jersey. She's not about being things like in the Belle Epoque, an object of desire, but she's really about doing things on the move. 
um, very much relating her style to you know, women that worked, um, that wanted to be independent. In the past, women had to be dressed, you know, by their husband, you know, help being dressed by husbands or maids, etc. Here, it's just quick dressing, you know, absolutely modern and what one would wear today. Um, you know, this whole, her basis of her clothing really was based on um, menswear and, um, you know, this cult of distinction of menswear, the codes of menswear, um, especially, you know, the patch pockets where one, she could put her lighter, her handkerchief, her keys, you know, be liberated from large handbags. It's quite extraordinary. And when we think of even the style of 1913 compared to 1928, um, what a radical shift. Um, extraordinary, actually. And, if, you know, I'd like you all to think about the context of the era. Now, of course, she did emulate um, Le Garçon or the boyish look of the 20s. Um, the flapper movement was um, very, very uh, strong. You know, women were working during World War I as they did in World War II, and they wanted to continue doing so in comfortable clothing that Chanel provided. And although she worked in couture and it was very expensive, the styles were easily translated to the mass fashion market for others, you know, and in this way, although she doesn't express herself as a feminist, um, she really helped the movement along. I think just looking at the current image on screen too, it's also a good reminder to think about the role she herself had in emulating her style. And throughout the exhibition, you will notice we've punctuated the chronology with a series of portraits of Gabrielle Chanel wearing her own designs. And, and she had a very strong underpinning philosophy that unless it was something that she would wear, then she wouldn't be making it. It was that sort of, she was almost her own test case for these clothes. And here you have a, a beautiful image on screen of that kind of merging almost of the, the masculine and the, and the feminine and a much more kind of casual and the word ease I think is, is the best one to sort of sum up that, um, that notion of not only in the clothes themselves but the attitude to wearing the clothes. There's a, a, a sense of wanting to have assert the same level of independence and presence through wearing of clothes. Yeah, if you'd like to sort of comment on that. Yeah, I mean, personally, I absolutely adore this photograph. It's so gorgeous on the beach um, in the late 20s. But, and I mean, one of the things that I expected to see more of in the exhibition actually was trousers, because I kind of think of Chanel and I think of trousers, but there is only one pair, and I think it's representative of the collection, um, and, and maybe less day wear in, the, in this particular exhibition. Um, but I think, you know, it's so interesting. This is so... Um, illustrative really of the way in which she used menswear but made it feminine too so really bringing the two together that this is they're very much almost wearing the same trousers and yet she styled it in such a different way that you, there is still that difference in the femininity and then yet how she's holding her cigarette is so masculine there's a really beautiful um, essay in in the catalogue by Caroline Evans talking about the dandy and and how Chanel was really a female dandy um, which I think is really an interesting way to think about her but I completely agree that she was you know, crafting her fashion and her brand in her own image, and that she as a person was so crucial to her brand and the success of her brand, um, and that it was more than just the garments, which I think, you know, tells us so much about the symbolism of fashion and the importance of it as a kind of cultural marker, but that it's, it was more than just fashion, it was the lifestyle that went along with wearing this sort of fashion, and that it allowed for a woman to be independent, to go out to work, to catch a taxi, um, and to go to the beach and, and be active and play tennis and what have you. Um, so I think it's more than just what it meant for wearing that, those garments, but actually what it symbolized in terms of living a, a life as a woman. Yeah, I mean, it almost sounds ridiculous sat here, doesn't it? You know, in 2021, expounding the virtues of being able to get a taxi or go to the beach. It sounds so 
um, the antithesis of our own lived experience, but I think it's actually good to pause on that and to recall that that is a significant shift um, and something that, you know, really does, there's the sort of before Chanel and after Chanel in terms of that broader understanding of, of how things shifted um, and how that connects to what we wear. We might go to the next slide now, and I'd be good to um, talk in the vein of this idea of the new woman to just um, think a little bit about who who was wearing her designs, particularly, I guess, in the early days um, and the way in which uh, the people wearing the clothes would emulate her ideas but also spread the word and create a, a desire amongst the broader population to be able to dress like this too. I think um, at the time with Chanel, um, even though her work seemed, well, not seemed, looked extremely revolutionary, and of course with, you know, wearing pants, I mean, she looks very glamorous in the previous image, you know, done up, beautiful um, head headpiece, etc., looking very feminine. But Chanel often with her short bobbed hair and, you know, jersey trousers with patch pockets and a a very simple sailor's top, uh, striped sailor's top, it looked incredibly androgynous at times. Now, Chanel, um, her circle of friends, uh, really interestingly, were a lot of the modernists, you know, from Picasso, um, you know, later Salvador Dali. She dressed, she dressed a lot of, um, of course, she dressed the couture clients. Uh, often also the middle classes too. But she would dress um, opera singer, I think, Martha, Martha de Velli, or she would dress, um, you know, the screen actresses, I think, Gabrielle Dorsiat. She had a, a wonderful circle of creatives that she did dress, and they were most happy to, you know, be wearing, um, wearing these avant-garde garments that suited the period, you know, the cub Cubist period of um, modernism. So, yes, she did do that. I mean, later, of course, you know, she dressed, once she came back, and perhaps even prior to that, she dressed uh, Marlena Dietrich, the incomparable Diana Vreeland. Um, later, also two stars of the screen, the silver screen, Elizabeth Taylor, Grace Kelly from memory, um, Audrey Hepburn, I mean, Audrey Hepburn was dressed a lot by Givenchy, but she was very keen on Chanel. So many, many. Um, I think we could just go on, the list could continue and continue. I think what's interesting there is that there's a um, sort of two clientele, where there's the sort of celebrity clientele and also the upper and sort of upper middle class. Um, so the arist aristocrats and uh, wealthy clients, but also celebrity. And so it's really, especially in that early period, at this moment of real burgeoning of celebrity culture, but also the media too. So the media had a, a great impact on kind of proliferating her designs and making them well recognized. Um, and so really kind of pushing that, her brand into the public eye through the media, through newspapers and things, which was really just happening at that moment, which was very important. I, th I think, you know, Ch Chanel's alignment with modernism has been celebrated by academics and curators alike, but recently fashion historian and writer Amy Delahaye has suggested that we also need to, I suppose, recalibrate our thinking and our focus on the aesthetic in her work to acknowledge that also, particularly in the 30s, um, Chanel's romantic and almost neo-historical designs came to the fore, uh, and these were Sort of more quiet and um, less radical, I guess, less overtly radical in their configuration. So I guess what, what does a moment like that do to complicate what we're saying about her in terms of how she's pushing these designs forward? And I'll get the next slide, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I really appreciate that <clears throat> rethinking of her, um, her impact on on fashion design, and it's not just linear. It's not like she just designed in one particular way, which I, I really appreciate that Amy Delahaye has kind of drawn attention to that. And that was one of the things that I think is sort of un, um, unexpected in this exhibition too. In that first room, there's three quite um, 
yeah, very romantic, um, colourful garments that are just quite beautiful and soft and they're sort of silk chiffon, they're really gorgeous, but really not what we think of in terms of the Chanel codes. They're not black and white, they're, they're floaty, they're romantic, you know, you want to wear, wear them to a garden party. It, funnily enough though, I think they're still incredibly modern, so they're still very contemporary. So they may be kind of, um, you know, evoking a different kind of historical period, and yet they are still modern. And they also show her kind of, her attention to detail, and also her kind of, um, it's still adhering to her lack of superfluous detail. So the details are refined, they're, they're delicate. When you look closely at it, which I'm always telling people, if you go to this exhibition, look closely at those details. The way that the fabric is cut around the leaves, Danny was pointing it out to us the other day, the way that the pink and the green go together, um, and it's very delicately sewn together. And then there's a plique of the flowers, which you also see on that beautiful, quite incredible uh, feathered dress as well in that first room. I think it still adheres to some of her modernist um, tenets, and yet it's got that romanticism too, which I, I just think shows um, you know, the complexity of her designs and also the complexity of her as a woman too. Um, that we don't necessarily only need to like sharp lines, we can be, you know, women of, of many sides. Because at the moment we've got on the screen, I suppose, one of the other icons for Chanel, which is the little black dress. And it's sort of, I guess this, this is the complexity and contrast we're talking about there. And there it's, it's definitely about modernity and about stri striking a chord with um, the aspiration of women to sort of seem like these urban chic, um, very contemporary women who are capable, uh, no matter their status or class, of engaging with the mo modern world. And yeah, it, it is that I guess is another one of those realms in which she she recognised that her design was going to be very popular and pop popular beyond those who could afford literally her couture examples of these. And she was actually quite at ease with the idea of being emulated and copied, whereas a lot of designers, I think, of this period and, and to this day are actually quite controlling and um, very afraid of this idea of being copied. And I think that's quite an interesting aspect to, I suppose, the idea of the dissemination of her work and her ideas, isn't it? Well, when you look at the little black dress, I mean, we know that probably for the last 500 years before that, black dress was worn in all different forms and styles um, as part of, you know, mourning um, one's passing. Later in the 20th century, we often would see a little black dress with a white collar um, for domestic servants. So it was really interesting for Chanel to be looking at workwear, uh, female workwear, and then considering the importance of um, popularising the style of the little black dress. And we see the one behind us, um, which uh, was featured in Vogue in 1926. I'm sorry I keep turning around. Um, in 1926. And, of course, um, you know, the Americans were incredibly in favour of Chanel designs and Vogue said that it would, um, the popularity of the little black dress would become a type of uniform and it was like um, the Ford Model T, you know, black and serious and uh, able to be produced en masse. So part of that incredible modernist um, wave of technology that kept sweeping through. But going back to the little black dress, um, it's really interesting. Paul Poiret, who was dressing women in long, beautiful, long dresses, empire line, with cloaks, etc. He very much, um, you know, he did coin the phrase, poverty deluxe. And he did say um, that when he did see the first little black dress on the streets in Paris, he did... He did actually say that, you know, once upon a time with his personal style, he dressed, you know, women looked um, amazing and um, like, you know, prows of a ship, whereas Chanel's little black dress really um, emulated the kind of undernourished little telephone clerk. So it's really interesting, um, but it's, it's fascinating how quickly the little black dress uh, was taken up. And we see different iterations. We see here Chanel photographed by Man Ray, you know, perhaps 10 years later, looking quintessentially modern, um, as 
Harriet said, you know, this modern woman thumbing her nose at tradition, smoking, which was quite taboo for a, um, a young, uh, a young uh, woman of a particular status to be doing. Her bobbed hair, the small, neat little hat, um, you know, the neat little black dress. It's quite, quite amazing. And look at us all, you know, we could wear those clothes. I mean, they could look a little retro, the 1920s version, but the other 1936 version could be worn easily today. So quite extraordinary. Um, and of course, following modernist principles. Um, coming from, you know, um, fashion design, history practice myself, um, I have to say it's very difficult for a designer, often young designers want to really overly embellish clothing. You know, they want to put lots on there. But Chanel had such an incredibly um, astute vision, you know, this modernist eye where she could look at a garment and take away and take away design details until they were just right, you know, with beautiful seams. I completely agree with Harriet. When you're looking at Chanel's work, you need to look up closely at the detail because even her floaty romantic dresses, if you look at them, you know, many of them are just in one colour and you need to go up close with the most beautiful detail um, in the self fabric. You know, they didn't have to be overly um, embellished with embroidery or sequins, although she did use that. I mean, she was terribly keen on peasant, um, you know, folkloric clothes and, um, you know, gypsies and colour, you know. So it's quite interesting, yeah. And I, I mean, one other thing, just thinking about that idea of the simple little black dress and sort of pairing things back is, again, this brilliant sort of flip on that that she does by introducing the idea of um, more is more when it comes to the jewellery. You know, and there's a great example. We all instantly, when we think of multiple strands of pearls, the, the person that comes to mind is Gabrielle Chanel. And, and often, you know, at this point, um, you know, she was also introducing from the 20s the idea of what we know today as costume jewellery. So inexpensive jewellery pr presented in the way that um, more luxurious fine jewellery was. And she was mixing the two. And she was also loading, loading up in what would have been seen as a very sort of gauche over the top way and instead of the jewellery being about a wealthy person particularly with evening wear displaying their wealth in a very direct way the way she used jewellery was often actually typically much more about day wear and about um, sort of thumbing a nose to that idea of wealth being um, a precedent. And, it, you know, this also goes to her background, I guess, when you are um, effectively lose your mother at a young age and, and you know, raised um, in an orphanage, you don't have that sense of entitlement that many people that she was mixing with was. So she played quite an interesting, dangerous game, I guess, with you know, bringing these people along with her on this journey and relying on them to sort of help emulate her style, but also playing, playing with that. Yeah, did you have... Yeah. yeah. Um, <clears throat> I think, I mean, as Liliana was saying, it's often um, much more challenging to, to make very simple garments. They're much harder to make. You don't have the embellishments to sort of distract from the workmanship. Um, but I think it's really fascinating to see the way she, she played with jewellery and the the jewellery box room that you have here is so beautiful. And there's very few pieces in it that are expensive pieces of jewellery, really, that have diamonds in them. The majority is um, costume jewellery, if you like. And there's one quite beautiful photograph of Chanel um, in her own, her own apartment where she's leaning against a sort of lacquered um, fireplace. And my colleague and I looked at it and we said, gosh, there's a, a famous quote from Chanel, like, before you leave the house, take one thing off. And I kind of said, I was like, oh, she could have taken one thing off here. Um, it's got a lot. She's really loaded up. She's got, you know, cuffs on both hands. She's got so many pearls. There's flowers in her hair. It's like quite outrageous. Um, but I think it's her sense of fun as well, which is interesting because we often think of her as sort of a more serious designer, but I think there is a sense of humour there too. Um, and also thinking about the other materials that she was using. I mean, she was using the menswear fabrics, the tweed, the, the jersey, which made things like the black, little black dress very easy to reproduce at home once patterns became available. 
But then also she was using a little bit of like, you know, those very expensive couture materials too, feathers. The feathers in the exhibition are quite amazing, the marabou, but also the rooster feathers. Um, but also a little bit of fur. She didn't use a lot of fur, but there's a couple of pieces that have fur on them. So it's, you know, she is tapping into what her clientele are looking for in terms of luxury, but using that in conjunction with other materials that are much cheaper or, you know, thought of in terms of menswear or underwear and things like that. And, and even the placement of this jewellery, you know, there's some quite lovely photographs where instead of wearing a brooch in the traditional place, sort of on, you know, near your heart basically, um, sometimes it'll be on the cuff of a sleeve or on a hip or even on a hat. So, yeah, she just doesn't want to play by the rules. That, that shines through, absolutely. We might hop to the next slide and um, leap forward a little bit just before we go into the sort of 50s period for Chanel, just remind ourselves more broadly of the context for that because um, Chanel does close the Couture House during, um, from 1939 during the war years and decides at the age of 70, would you believe, um, in the early 50s, in 1953, to reopen and one of the focuses that she um, chooses to, to look at in reintroducing her style is the suit. And we'll talk a little bit more about that at the moment. But it's before we do so, it's just good to think about the likes of Christian Dior and the new look and what was happening more broadly in terms of people starting to question um, the role and place of women. So back to you both. <laughs> I'm, I mean, I think Liliana mentioned this earlier, but you know, during the Second World War, when she did close um, her design house, she was still selling perfume and some accessories, some bags and things, but um, she wasn't designing during that time. But of course, women were involved in the workforce. They were really called upon as men went off to war. And so they'd, <clears throat> they'd had this period during the Second World War as they had had in the First World War, but to an even greater extent, where they were in the workforce. They were out of the home. They were wearing kind of much more practical garments to participate in the war effort. And then suddenly the war ended and they were expected to just go back to being housewives. And so there was a real tension there and Dior was de designing, putting women back into these corsets, thinking, okay, we're going to have a return to what we had prior to the war and I think Chanel was like no 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 we can't go back um, and of course I mean Liliana will probably elaborate on this but when she first came back in the 1950s early 1950s she really wasn't it wasn't well received at all especially in Paris and so I think what the second period is so fascinating um, what, what is so fascinating about that second period is how she was taken up in the States where there was even more women kind of being able to enter the workforce, the, the, the feminist movement really gaining a lot of traction in the 60s and into the 70s. Um, and so her, her garments, which really adhered to those earlier tenets of modernist design, really found a home there and were really taken up with fervor, um, much more so than they kind of were in, in Paris where couture sort of reigned. Maybe you want to... Absolutely, Harriet. Um, well, it's really interesting, you know, when there's... Um, deprivations during the war and of course we know you know famously during World War II women were expected perhaps to make a suit out of a meter and a half of fabric and we know about all the um, make um, make and mend ethos um, etc but you know Christian Dior not taking away from him was extraordinary for the period he had a great love of um, you know Victorian costume and I think it was absolutely um, legend that you know he would visit museums and have a look at how garments at the time were constructed. Women were in an absolute frenzy, not only in Paris, in Australia, in Sydney, crazy for the new look. However, and Europe of course and the States, he did extremely well and he reigned supreme for 10 years as we know until he passed away in 1957. Having said that, not all women were enamoured by the style. And, you know, I think um, one of the feminist movements, you know, the little above the knee um, group were very much against, you know, they used to, they would claim or exclaim, how can a woman work, you know, with 20 metres of fabric in a skirt, etc. cetera, um, and the little waspy waist. It, um, so Chanel in the background um, was quite dismayed by what was happening, as Harriet said. When she did come back, 
Paris absolutely abhorred her styles. They talked about um, ghosts of couture past. They were not in favour of Chanel whatsoever. However, within three collections, three seasons, year and a half or so, um, she started to make inroads. And I, like Harriet said too, her great saviours, in my personal opinion, were Elle magazine, um, Vogue, Harper's Bazaar um, in the United States. And it just seemed to fit her lovely modernist suit, which of course she made changes to, you know, different pockets, but essentially um, very simple unification of lines. The luxury was hidden. Um, you know, there was a match between the blouse and um, the lining of the jacket. She had beautiful, luxurious things, details like having the flat chain and the hem of the jackets to hold their shape because the fabrics were so beautiful, the boucles, the, the tweeds, then they would fly away. And we know, you know, all you have to do is put your arm up and the jacket sits at the bust line. So this beautiful, beautiful luxury. Um, I really admire Chanel because she stuck to her modernist principles. Um, or the way she liked to dress. I mean, it was all about the way she liked to dress and how she felt elegant, professional, or women that were just interested in um, looking well-dressed. They didn't have to be working. So in America, um, she was just trailblazing within three seasons. And slowly, slowly, Paris accepted her again, and um, she became extremely successful. But it, it was different again, because when we think about the context of the time, you know, the 1960s, when we think about um, the works of, you know, André Courage, Mary Quant, um, you know, Pierre Cardin, um, the miniskirt. Now, Chanel absolutely never wanted to raise the skirt above the knee line because she felt that the knee was the most ugly part of a woman's or unattractive part of a woman's body. But still, her neat suits had a very contemporary feel. Um, and, you know, the likes of, you know, Romy Schneider, all these wonderful um, actresses at, at the time were very keen on wearing Chanel once again. I mean, I think that's a quite an interesting point too. Um, you know, there were the likes of Romy, Brigitte Bardot, a number of the sort of new wave starlets of the period who happily, you know, not long after the um, editors of those various magazines came on board, also became, you know, decked out from head to toe in their Chanel, um, which is also when you think about the fact that Chanel herself, again, throughout this period, she is wearing these clothes that she's creating, and she by now is in her 70s and 80s. So, you know, another really interesting thing, I think, perhaps to reflect on is acknowledging that fashion is often quite ageist <laughs> um, and is generally targeting youth, um, that this particular garment form was something almost kind of uniquely able to span, you know, the wardrobe of a 20-something um, to a woman many decades older. And I think this is quite an important thing to sort of reflect on as well, isn't it? And we do, um, it's worth noting when you go into the exhibition, we have an entire room, uh, 35 examples from this period of the 60s in particular of these suits. And amongst them is one very similar to the one on the right of the screen, actually, that belonged to and was worn by Gabrielle Chanel herself. So she again is this sort of embodiment of her ideals and persisting, you know, even in the face of those first couple of years of um, real pushback from the, the, the fashion press. Um, yeah. Yeah, I think it's, it's really fantastic in the exhibition that you have so much um, of those portraits and also the, the video imagery as well, because you can maybe look at some of those suits and they perhaps look a little bit stuffy or perhaps out of step in, in that second, in that kind of final room as well. You sort of think, what, what else was happening in the world in the 60s? Um, is this really, you know, was she, had she lost her way sort of thing? Uh, were those ghosts right? Um, but when you see the video footage, you can see how sort of youthful they still look um, and they really bring the garments to life and show the, the modernity of them, but also their sort of relevance to a younger clientele, despite the fact that Chanel herself 
was much, much older. Um, it's kind of interesting commentary in the last few years using kind of older models in fashion photography and fashion um, sort of advertising. Um, but, you know, with interviews with older women, they often say, oh, okay, cool, that's great, that's a, a token, but these designers aren't designing for an older clientele, an older woman. Um, whereas I think what Chanel was doing, as you say, was in many ways age ageless, um, which is, is unique and sort of radical in a way as well. If we think about the different sort of dimensions of her radical approach to dressing women, um, that she was really kind of inclusive of that. Although we maybe say, you know, it's a very specific silhouette, it's a very specific body type that she is dressing. Um, so there's still exclusions there, but. Um, I think I'd also like to add that um, working in uh, the 60s and producing these incredible suits, which many, many of us have come to love and adore, um, I certainly do, that, you know, um, the wonderful Yves Saint Laurent was incredibly influenced uh, by Coco Chanel. And although his work is different, um, he was heavily inspired by her use of the suits and, you know, masculine codes in her fashion practice. You know, when he was uh, producing Le Tuxedo or his safari suits, um, or, you know, you may remember back in um, the late 60s, suits that were made out of jersey and knitted. So an incredible, you know, she had an incredible influence over contemporary designers too. And I know Harriet, you know, even with Oleg Cassini, all the work um, for Jackie Kennedy, etc. You know, it, it, it's difficult to say which is the Chanel and which isn't. Um, do you want to? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, we, we mentioned that a little bit earlier in terms of the Model T Ford and the reproducibility and I guess that democratisation of fashion, as we might want to call it. But um, there was a, an image on the slide from, from Jackie Kennedy wearing a pink Chanel suit, but it had been made in a line-by-line -line copy technique. So it wasn't actually a Chanel suit because, of course, as First Lady, she had to wear American fashion, but it was a direct Chanel pink suit um, that she wore when um, this you know, very famous photographs of her. She was wearing it in the motorcade when JFK was assassinated. Um, and it is still in storage with the blood of JFK on it. It's never been laundered. Um, and so it was, again, you know, the, the power of the media as well, as I mentioned before, but the reproducibility, the copying of those suits. But that she just didn't seem to mind that, that that was part of the allure, part of her brand as well, was that it was... Um, available to more women who, than those who could simply just afford to buy a Chanel suit. Chanel was very important with the, um, you know, in the aspects of the democratisation of fashion, um, a fashion that could be copied by all. And, she, and as you say, she was very happy. When we think about Chanel allowing many of the man, mass manufacturers um, into her own couture house, um, of course, you know, for a fee, license fee, etc. But, you know, she, there was, it was a very highly successful business. And I think wonderful um, that, you know, women of all ages were able to actually buy, as you said, a, you know, line by line copy of a Chanel suit and wear it comfortably. Um, whether it was, um, I, think, I think she said that. Um, you know, in New York, 7th Avenue, so many of the mass production houses there um, were licensing Chanel. So incredible, you know, so she might make, I don't know, 400 garments per season. She might sell 28,000 couture or pret-a-porter garments, but the mass manufacturers, you know, you could times that by 100 or 1,000. Um, so this incredible, um, I think the democratisation of fashion is, is one of her, you know, important to her legacy. Um, speaking of legacy, we're probably coming towards the end of our time together this morning, but it would be lovely just maybe for each of you to reflect, if I can, um, you know, when we first approached you on this topic, kind of what you imagined, it, where you imagined it would take you, and I guess maybe some of the unexpected things that you've come to think of slightly differently as you know, people as we are who work in this area and think a lot, the opportunity when you get to see over 200 examples of one woman's work across her whole lifespan, and remembering this is over 100 years, um, really now that Chanel 
has existed as an entity in fashion and that legacy is still so strong. Yeah, perhaps just some final reflections um, in relation to her contribution and perhaps with that sort of feminist perspective. Yeah, sure. Um, I mean, I was <laughs> delighted to be asked to contribute and it really did get me thinking about those relationships between fashion and feminism in, in the context of Chanel's work. Um, and I already kind of thought about her enduring legacy, if, if we want to call it that, um, in terms of particularly personally for me, the, the photograph with, of her at the beach um, with the trousers and the, and the shirt and the pearls and things and the very sort of modern, chic sort of, sort of look. Um, but then in terms of what is actually in the exhibition, and I've been lucky enough to see it twice now, um, but even looking in that very first room, um, there's a, a garment, sleeveless garment with a collar um, and, and pleating, and it's, it's from you know, her very early work <clears throat> in the 1910s or into the 20s, and it's just so modern, and you can look at it and think, I would wear that today. I mean, I probably wouldn't want to because it's so delicate. There's also another one which is beautiful fabric with some bows on it, um, but has this most incredible sort of crisscross seaming on it, which you then see throughout the exhibition as a recurring theme and the asymmetry of her hems that just hang so beautifully. Um, and I think the, the sort of unexpected elements were those more, um, more luxurious garments, um, because we think of her so much in terms of day wear, in terms of jersey, in terms of those kind of more um, egalitarian um, materials. But to see those, those, uh, those garments was really special, um, and the velvet cloak with the marabou feathers was just a standout for me as a really special one. And then the, the also, I must have a thing about feathers because the feather garment um, from the Museum of Art, Applied Arts and Sciences that's been kindly lended as well is just so magnificent. And to see it alongside the footage of it being fitted by Chanel, and she's saying, too many feathers, take the feathers away. Um, it's just so beautiful. And so I think seeing those unexpected um, garments that we don't necessarily think of immediately when we think of Chanel um, has been really wonderful to see and to, I think, for, for the public as well, to sort of broaden their understanding of what Chanel was about um, and, and how she designed. For me too, Harriet, um, quite a few of the garments you've mentioned um, were just extraordinary. I think looking at the House of Chanel um, over the years, the the really big surprise, um, a wonderful surprise for me, was looking at the scale of her jewellery, the enamel jewellery. Um, I was absolutely, I have to be honest, blown away. I thought that the pieces would be small and delicate, um, and yet, you know, there are floral brooches that are, you know, as large as your hand or larger, incredible um, jewellery. I think the way she worked um, hands-on with jewellers of the period, you know, Duke... Um, Feldu uh, oh, I've just forgotten, Delfa Dura and Goosens, etc. I mean, it's just extraordinary. And unlike what you said too, you know, we think of Chanel in strict, um, you know, adhering to strict modernist lines, but it was that flourish. And I love that um, Amy De La Haye said, you know, Chanel felt that a suit looked naked without um, jewellery. And Boy, she really, really went for it, and it's just quite amazing. I think the fact that she looked back at, you know, Renaissance jewellery, those beautiful big enamel cups, um, you know, she was aware of other historical precedents, but the way they were interpreted in a modern way really took me by surprise. I, I thought that was ex extraordinary. Also, as Harriet said, some of the more deluxe, um, you know, the cloaks, um, her evening wear, just the attention to detail um, and having to look close, beautiful, beautiful ways, the way of, you know, design lines, the simple fabric, one colour, but the way the cut, the pattern making, for me was amazing. I'm a maker myself, I know how difficult um, these things are. So for me, that was extraordinary. But last but not least, I am so enamoured by her suits. I have been for the last 30 or more years. Um, one suit in particular um, is a cream suit and it has, um, instead of her normal buttoning through the front with the gilt buttons, um, it has braid that comes down 
um, just, a, just a piece down the front emulating men's sportswear, but so incredibly chic, so, and the colourways too. Um, I just, I've, I've, been, I've been very surprised by those pieces. I didn't know about them. So for me, it's such a delight. The exhibition is exquisite and I congratulate the NGV. It's beautiful. Thank you. And I, I think the, the things I might add to that as well is for me, really, truly understanding just how hands-on this woman was. And you, you, know, you see it in that footage with that incredible 30s dress. She's down on her knees, scissors in hand, making this poor mannequin stand for hours and hours, I'm assuming, until she perfects it. She was not someone that sketched. A lot of designers obviously start with a sketch, hand that over to the atelier to execute in garment form. But it makes sense to me as because she foregrounded the fact that it was her as the wearer, her as the woman, this is how her design ideas were trialled and experimented. And so she needed to create these pieces on another woman's body as well. So that, that's really strong to me. And I think the, the portraits also constantly reinforce that. And, and I guess one of the other things just for me um, that I've loved about this whole experience of learning more about her is the room we've dedicated to the perfume and the makeup. And we have remarkably um, an incredibly rare and special example of the very first bottle from 1921 of Chanel Number no. 5. Um, it sort of sits in the centre of this display like a sort of glowing relic. It's really amazing. But what's remarkable is recognising that at the time she introduced that perfume, it was really the first time a move away from... Traditionally, perfume at that time was about replicating the smell of violets or rose or sort of a very singular idea of a woman smelling like a flower, basically. And they often had quite ornate bottles and kind of over-the-top names. But what Chanel did in an instant is create this incredibly modern singular idea, which was to use many, many ingredients, over 80 ingredients in this fragrance, to instead create the scent of a woman, a modern woman. It's not about replicating a flower. It's something kind of you can't put your finger on. And to present it in a bottle that is the most pared back, you know, it's just a very simple glass cube, effectively. And then seeing subsequently how she introduced that same idea of the modern woman into the makeup, the tanning lotion, the sort of mini compacts to sort of take away traveling with you, all of these things, and you look at them and they're still pretty much as you will find them um, behind the counter of any department store now. And I think, again, it's one of those things that, you know, it's connected to fashion and it's part of her vision and it really does give you a sense of just how phenomenally um, critical her shift in thinking about how women present themselves and want to articulate their, express their identity through their dress and even their scent was so important um, for us to this day. So on that note, <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining us today and I hope you've had pause for thought to think a little bit about the contribution of um, this one extraordinary woman um, and I would love to thank most importantly, um, our wonderful guests today, Dr. Harriet Richardson and Dr. Liliana um, Pomazan, for helping us explore the, the curly topic of uh, Gabrielle Chanel and feminism. Thank you so much. <laughs>